In the first video of this series, we told you about the catastrophic climate change event that happened 252 million years ago. Volcanic activity in today's Siberia covered an area the size of Australia and released vast amounts of CO2. As a result, the atmosphere heated up rapidly and the oceans acidified and became depleted in oxygen. This culminated in the end Permian mass extinction, during which between 85 and 95% of all species in the oceans and 70 to 80% of all species on the land went extinct. But who survived? And why? In this video, we'll talk about how species and individual organisms respond to temperature-related stress, and what determines why some species go extinct while others survive. If you see this picture of a polar bear, perhaps the first thing that comes to mind is glaciers and ice caps. When you think of a camel, you probably picture it living in the desert. When you see a coral reef, you likely think of a beautiful, warm, tropical ocean in which you can snorkel around and have a perfect holiday. I think you get the point. Every organism likes to live where it's best adapted to be successful, including its habitat. The conditions under which a species can live and produce viable offspring make up the niche of the organism. An important part of a species niche is the temperature. Every species has an optimum temperature for growth and reproduction, and a temperature range under which it can survive, called its thermal niche. From the first video, you know that we can obtain environmental temperatures for modern as well as fossil organisms. This is how we visualize a species thermal niche. On the x-axis, we have temperature, and on the y-axis, performance, or in other words, how well the species is doing. The highest point on the curve corresponds to the temperature the species prefers or performs best at, its optimal temperature. The two ends, where the performance hits zero, are the lower and upper limit, at which the species can't survive anymore. A thermal tolerance curve can be bell-shaped, with the lower limit extending a little further than the upper limit. Of course, some specialist species have a narrower thermal niche, which can make them more vulnerable, or a broader tolerance, making them more resilient to temperature fluctuations. Because of global temperature changes, the climate in which a species lives can change rapidly and unpredictably. If the temperature rises outside of a species' optimal range, its comfort zone, individuals will likely become stressed and perform worse. When climatic conditions become unsuitable, there are three ways in which a species can react to these changes. And we can observe these responses, both in the deep past and in the present climate crisis. Firstly, migration. Perhaps the most obvious and easiest solution to this problem would be to follow the species' preferred climate and change location. Scientists have a fancy term for this called niche tracking. Yeah, so niche tracking means that as the Earth warms, on average, species are moving poleward, tracking their preferred climate. Now, they can either do this by adult uh, migration, if they're mobile enough, or by their juveniles, essentially, uh, settling in more suitable habitat over time. Now we observe this kind of species survival strategy in the fossil record as occurring over the past nearly half a billion years. So it's been going on for quite a long time. However, not all species can simply pack up their bags and move when their habitat gets too hot. Some may be kept from migrating by food availability or by physical barriers such as open ocean or by land which prevents them from accessing habitats on the other side. Of course, as well, if the rate of climate change is too fast, so many species may simply fail to keep up, whether they're mo mobile or not. The second response to changes in temperature? Adaptation. Another option is to adapt in some way to deal with the environmental changes. One response of organisms to rising temperatures that's commonly observed by both ecologists and paleontologists is a reduction in body size. In the fossil record, there are several patterns during ancient warming events that can produce, on average, smaller communities. The first one would be the preferential extinction of larger organisms. Then secondly, these larger organisms could just disappear temporarily and then reappear a while after the event. We call that Lazarus taxa. The third option would be the origination of predominantly small species after the event. And the fourth is what we call the Lilliput effect, where individuals within a species decrease in adult body size in response to the climatic stress and this is also what modern ecologists are seeing in experiments and today's oceans. But how can a temperature increase lead to smaller organisms? There is no one-size-fits-all explanation for this, but for ectotherms, which are organisms that can't control their body temperature, there is the temperature size rule that holds up pretty well. So with higher temperature, 
the growth and development of earlier life stages is accelerated and then adulthood is reached and therefore growth finishes at a smaller size than usual. And these smaller adults then have a lower metabolic rate and they need less food and oxygen to survive. And as you might imagine, that comes in pretty handy if you live in a hot and oxygen depleted ocean that probably also isn't the best habitat for the things that you want to eat. And the final response of a species to changes in temperature. Extinction. If a population can't migrate or adapt, it's very likely to die out because of climate change. If this happens in many places all at once, a species may go extinct. But not all species automatically go extinct when this happens. Migration or rain shifts are the most common response of species today to climate change. And this already tells us that species would rather move than adapt. And the fossil record tells us that adaptation is actually rare and has very hard limits. Extinction is a common response when migration fails. There are multiple factors that play a role in deciding whether or not a species will survive a warming-induced extinction event. For example, organisms that have a wide thermal niche, so that can live in different temperature environments, or they have certain materials to construct the skeletons, for example, having calcite or silica is better than having aragonite, or they have low metabol metabolic rates, can skew the species odds for survival. To the contrary, extinction selectivity against survival increases when species harbor photosymbionts. And the most prominent species harboring symbionts are reef corals. And this is actually what makes reef corals and coral reefs so sensitive to climate change, as the IPCC also informs us. Where an organism lives is also crucial for its survival. For example, species adapted to strong seasonal temperature changes may be better off than species adapted to stable climate conditions, such as most tropical species. Indeed, a trend we can observe in the present climate warming is that tropical species may be more vulnerable than mid-latitude species. Going back to the Permian-Triassic mass extinction, there were many casualties during this crisis, and whole groups of animals went extinct. Most notably, horn corals and tabulate corals, the main reef builders of the Paleozoic era, disappeared for good after this event. Other well-known victims that never came back were trilobites and sea scorpions. After the mother of all mass extinctions was over, some opportunistic disaster taxa took over. These are often surviving species that have a very broad ecological niche, which allowed them not only to survive, but also to spread globally into vacated niches. Two disaster taxa were Chloria, a scallop-like clam in the oceans, and Lystrosaurus, a cumbersome mammal-like reptile on land. Hopefully this video gave you an overview of the responses of organisms to climate change and taught you that paleontologists and modern ecologists often observe very similar patterns on different timescales. Tune in to the next video in which we'll show you some science-approved ways you can help to preserve the wonderfully diverse fauna on our planet. If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about news in climate science and climate change in the past, follow us on Twitter and visit our website.